Before we begin today's Clinical Omics Live, live, here's a word from Charlene Sohn Rigby from our sponsor, Fabric Genomics. Great, thank you, Chris. My name is Charlene Sohn Rigby, and I'm the Chief Business Officer of Fabric Genomics. We're excited to sponsor this interview with Dr. Ewan Ashley. Our vision at Fabric is to make it possible for every patient to receive genomics-driven precision medicine. We enable clinicians to deliver on precision medicine by giving them tools to quickly and accurately interpret genomic data. Alongside luminaries such as Dr. Ashley, our founder, Dr. Martin Rees and others have done groundbreaking research to enable the use of genomics to diagnose and treat rare disease. In support of clinicians such as Dr. Ashley in their work to treat seriously ill patients, Fabric has pioneered industry-defining AI algorithms for analyzing genomes. Our technology is in use by leading institutions for rare disease diagnosis, including Rady Children's and LabCorp. Our latest algorithm, Fabric Gem, sets a new standard for diagnostic accuracy, using advanced AI to algorithmically identify not only the most likely disease-causing genes, but also to match these with the patient's phenotype to develop a preliminary genetic diagnosis. Our goal is to democratize access to the expertise of leading geneticists such as Dr. Ashley by incorporating knowledge from multiple disciplines and sources into software that can be used broadly, and in this way to end diagnostic odysseys for more patients. Scientific advances, clinical, and patient education are needed to bring diagnoses to every patient that needs it. An estimated three to 5% of all individuals on the planet, a stunning 350 million people. Driving N of one to millions is Fabric's mission, not just for rare disease, but for hereditary risk, cancer, and even newborn screening to enable healthcare providers everywhere to provide best of breed care to anyone, anywhere, using distributed IT systems. Thank you, Charlene, and welcome everybody today to the inaugural episode of Clinical Omics Live. I'm Chris Anderson, Editor-in-Chief of Clinical Omics, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my colleague, Kevin Davis, who's the Executive Editor of the CRISPR Journal. For our first ever Clinical Omics Live, I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest, Dr. Ewan Ashley. If anyone in our audience is unfamiliar with Ewan's work, he's a leading medical geneticist at Stanford University and author of the book, The Genome Odyssey, which was published only yesterday by Celadon Books. A cardiologist by training, Dr. Ashley has been at the leading edge of genomic medicine for about a dozen years now and led the team that conducted arguably the first in-depth interpretation of a full genome sequence. He's also a co-founder of Personalis, among other companies. Today, we'll talk about his book, Advances in Genome Analysis and Interpretation, the Real World Implementation of Genomic Medicine, and much more. So without further ado, let's get to the questions. Before we start, I'd like to remind our audience that we want this to be interactive. So if you have a question at any time, we will take questions from the audience. Simply type it in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. So let's get to the questions. Welcome, Ewan. It's a pleasure having you join us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to join you. Ex excellent. So. Um, as I mentioned a little bit, you're a deputy associate dean at Stanford, a practicing cardiologist. You're involved in the Undiagnosed Disease Network and Stanford Health, among a bunch of other things. So you're certainly not lacking for things to do. So what prompted you to want to write the book, The Genome Odyssey? Well, I think you're right. And I think my uh, lab and my family and my wife would probably agree with you that I have enough jobs. Um, but you know, I, I came to science originally uh, through popular science books, through reading. In fact, my high school teachers um, were themselves perhaps not the, the most inspiring, if I'm being honest, <laughs> about science. 
but one of them really turned things for me when he, we used to talk actually after class. In fact, we used to talk about jazz with saxophone player. <laughs> and one day he said, here, take, why don't you read this? You seem a bit bored in class. And he gave me a copy of Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. And I think that part of my fate was sealed on that day because I, I read this book, dived in, just immersed myself and was just unbelievably blown away by the lucid writing, the wonder that Dawkins has for biology, his clear explanations of, of genes and, and just the whole framing of that book. And many of your uh, watchers and listeners <clears throat> will be familiar with it. And so I think from that moment, I was maybe 16. And I went on to read Stephen Jay Gould and <clears throat> Steve Pinker and ma many other books. And a lot of the science I learned before I ever got to college was through, through those books. <clears throat> and I think that I, I knew at one point I would want to give this a shot, try and write a book for the, um, for, for the general reader. And then the other part of it was just that I, I live completely in awe of, of what my patients go through. You mentioned a few of the uh, roles I have at Stanford, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network is a great example of, of patients and families who go from doctor to doctor, you know, on these long odysseys um, where they, they spend years trying to find answers. And I think just watching what they go through really felt, made me feel that I, I wanted to try to tell their stories. So that was in my head. But then I also thought, you know, as you mentioned, I have four or five jobs. So one day I'll do that. Maybe when I retire or maybe I'll take a sabbatical. <clears throat> And I remember actually the exact moment when I decided that I shouldn't wait, that I was lucky enough to work a little with the uh, Obama administration and around their precision medicine initiative. And I was at an event where Atul Gawande was interviewing Barack Obama. And Obama, especially in those last couple of years of his administration, became very clear what a, a techno geek he was, just how much he loved science and technology. <clears throat> and as I watched these two amazing writers and just inspirational people talk, I just sat there in the audience and thought, you know, I shouldn't wait. So I should give this a shot. I still had no idea that it would ever become a book or that, that I would ever be able to write one, but I, I've tried and now there's one out in the world. So I, I do hope that uh, people enjoy it. So, so like Gawande, as you mentioned, you really were looking to uh, uh, write a book for the general audience, uh, for, for general audiences. But is there is there a greater purpose that you hope that this book will serve uh, for those who read it in well, I'm really hoping, yes. I mean, I think I obviously want to tell the stories of the courage and incredible fortitude of, of these families. Um, but there's so many out there who, who haven't got access to genome sequencing and who could benefit. So many others who are on their own long and, and adventurous eventful journey, their own medical odyssey. And I think that those of us who are involved in clinical genomics really see the power and, and understand the life-changing capacity of this technology uh, for for individuals, and I think we want to to make sure it's available to us to everyone who needs it. So I think that that's definitely part of of the underlying theme. And I think we're, we're at a really exciting moment where, at the moment, the the genome is is really relevant for those with with rare disease, and that's what we're that's the group that we're using it in already. But I think we're at a very interesting moment where we're going to start to be able to use that genome data much more widely uh, through things like polygenic risk scores for prevention of disease, that the true attainment of, of the idea of precision or personalized medicine. And so I think that's another part of the message. And I, I talk a bit about that towards the end of the book. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's a long way from Scotland to Palo Alto <laughs> and- uh, yeah. In both ways, you know, geographically first, and <laughs> philosophically. You, you know, you became a cardiologist, certainly comfortable in that role based on your parents' role models, but can you detail quickly uh, you know, some of the events that, that, that happened over the course of, of your time that brought you to Stanford to do the work that you're doing now? Yeah, and I think that, um, as I, I mentioned at, at the beginning of the book, yeah, my, and you mentioned that my, my parents, uh, my dad was a local GP, my mom was a local uh, midwife, and um, so medicine was in our, our family, and, and actually we lived kind of in, in the, um, on the border between a, an area that was fairly well off and a, an area that was where there was uh, many, uh, there was more uh, poverty, and, and my mom worked in one area, my dad worked in the other. So our, our dinner table conversation was was pretty interesting from the perspective of both uh, social um, and other uh, contributors to to health and, and disease. And so I was very much in, inspired by them, of course. And um, 
but there's another aspect i think to my personality and that i was like many of us i, I think who, who'd involved in this area just a geek basically at heart and i got a computer when i was 12 years old and just instantly loved the power of being able to to program that computer and like many kids of course i played games too and wasted a lot of hours doing that but but i was even more fascinated by the ability that you could give commands to this machine and it would do things and you know i started by writing games which is mostly to impress my friends uh back in that day this was basic the language was basic and you know the the art that you had to draw yourself i drew a little grid by hand and, and made little icons for these horses that made them look like they were running um, so that was my first, uh, one of my earliest programs, but, uh, you know, then I, I got interested in, in, in other things and I ended up at one point building a tax package. I, I, goodness knows why I chose that, but for my dad's medical practice, because I noticed that he had to look up these pages of books to work out how much tax to, to take off for every employee. And I noticed there was a pattern in those books and that it was a fairly reproducible uh, pattern that, that could be expressed as a mathematical function. So we built it into a, a program and, and it allowed him to, to save some time. Um, certainly for that year, I, I mentioned in the book, of course, they changed the whole tax code the next year, which taught me a very important lesson about, well, so governments you, so you've and taxes. Always, so you've always been interested in the computational aspect of, right. of, of, of life. Um, I think, uh, yeah, people who've seen some of your talks in the past are very familiar with uh, the analogy that you use, your Ferrari analogy, right? right. Like the original cost of the human genome versus the cost of a brand new Ferrari. Uh, when was the last time you did that calculation? And based on the reduction in cost of sequencing a human genome, how much does that Ferrari cost these days? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I did this uh, just with the book coming out. I, I, I did kind of update it with a, a, a new Ferrari that was actually available now. Um, and Ferraris are about the same price they've been, it would appear, not that I really know except in this context, but right, you know, right. three or four hundred thousand dollars, I think, will get you a new Ferrari. Uh, but if we say that a genome is now, you know, it depends if you want to call it five hundred dollars, there'd be a reason to say that an Illumina genome, probably not far from that. Of course, there's talk of a hundred dollar uh, genome. Um, so that would take a Ferrari down from around three hundred thousand dollars to basically one cent. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're going to start having to use fractions shortly, yeah. which, which is just, of course, incredible. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I threw this up one day, I think, just before a talk. I, I just, I, you know, we're all used to, um, we're all used to seeing the Moore's Law graph with the genome sequencing coming down. In fact, it got to the point where it was so overused that uh, people were doing playing bingo at, uh, you know, sitting in the audience going, okay, Moore's Law graph, yeah, tick, you know, and all, all the different things that you would see about the genome. Yeah. And I, I partly as a response to that, and partly also because often we give talks to a broad ranging audience who, you know, people switch off when they see a graph, but there's something about a re something real in the world that appears really expensive, bringing it into the range of something that's, that's affordable by everyone that, that seems to bring that alive. Yeah, well, you can't ignore that, uh, that, it's, that you could buy a Ferrari, buy a Ferrari for a penny based on the reduction. So um, I want to bring in, I want to bring in uh, Kevin Davis now. Um, I know he's been keen over the years um, uh, and very interested in the work that you did uh, interpreting Steve Quake's genome. So uh, over to you, Kevin, and you can ask uh, you and a few questions about that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris, and congratulations on getting uh, Clinical Omics Live underway. And you, and congratulations on the book. Uh, it's wonderful, not only for the information that you impart and the stories you tell, but it's just written in such a down-to-earth uh, manner um, without any airs or pretend. It's almost like you're just chatting to a mate in a bar back in, back in Glasgow. So, uh, I mean, that is the greatest compliment. It's, uh, uh, it's going to do very, very well. Um, I wanted to, you spent the first part of the book, and I thought I would just quickly um, throw up this old cover from uh, a former magazine uh, that I uh, helped run, BioIT World, of Steve Quake back in 2009 posing in front of the heliscope, um, the a would be uh, competitor to the Illumina sequencing. Uh, it was a ferocious time in, in next gen sequencing. Yeah. But you led the team uh, that really did one of, if not the first full clinical genome interpretation. I would, uh, um, we can't have this conversation without maybe going back in time, 10, 10, 11 years, and you telling us some of the highlights of what you recall from that, from that story. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's very nostalgic-inducing, uh, seeing that cover. Uh, Steve looking a little 
uh, younger there. Um, Back when he had hair. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And um, Norma in the background is actually still working with Steve as part of the Champion uh -huh. World Biohub. Uh, yeah. And Dimitri also in that photo who has uh, founded several companies. Now, I, I met him a few months ago in, in, in Truckee, of all places, in Safeway in Truckee. So that was the last time I saw Dimitri. Um, yeah, it was an unbelievable time, I, thinking back. And just, um, you know, Steve had, had sequenced his genome using this telescope, this technology he invented, and he'd made some headlines for doing that. Um, and just like the three or four genomes before, and there weren't very many at that point, it was certainly, you know, fingers of one hand sort of thing, fingers of two hands. Um, and some of, for sure, other groups, Baylor Group, for example, uh, had, had definitely with Jim Watson's genome started to look into some cancer genes and some other things. But I think that what, what came about with our interaction with Steve was the idea that, that genomes really were coming um, to the point, well, to everyone at some point. I mean, they dropped to that point, you know, from the, the billions of dollars it took for the Human Genome Project to, to that point, $40,000, I think, Steve's one cost. And, you know, that, that's one of the first stories I, I tell in the book is basically meeting him. I didn't know him that well, and we were organizing a seminar, actually. Um, for those who follow this, Mike Snyder was coming to Stanford from Yale. We knew he was coming, and, and I was actually going to talk to Steve about hosting a seminar uh, that, Steve, that Mike would, would give, you know, before, before he came as chair of genetics. And, uh, but we never really got to that because I came in and sort of found him in his office. He was surrounded by piles of books and, uh, you know, he was at a keyboard tapping away and on the screen was, was uh, this table, one of these old HTML tables, uh, and on it were clearly genetic variants. I mean, as somebody who uh, in clinic sends testing, at that point we sent testing on maybe five genes, maybe eight genes. It would take three months to come back, cost $5,000. And suddenly, he, you know, I was asking him what he was looking at, and he said, well, it's my genome. And that was just a revelatory moment. I mean, the idea that there was a genome on the screen in front of me was, was incredible. But more than that, he was pointing at genes, actually. And this was a, a tool that George Church's group had put together. Um, and uh, it had highlighted a few variants in his genome. And I recognized one of the genes, and it was one that caused cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so I started asking him about his family history of, of uh, any heart disease, which you do as a doctor. And he started telling me, oh yeah, my family have actually been telling me to go see a cardiologist because we have so much of a family history um, of heart disease. And then he mentioned his cousin's son who died, died suddenly at 19 years old. And at that point, the whole thing switched. It became really much more of a doctor patient conversation. And I, I essentially invited him to my clinic and sort of compelled him to come to the clinic. And he said, oh yeah, my family have been trying to make me do that. Um, and we realized at that moment that he was about to walk into a clinic essentially with his whole genome and probably be the first patient who would actually do that. And so the, what came after was, how do we answer that question? Because in, in, in medicine, we're used to five numbers, like especially in cardiology, like a lipid panel, cholesterol panel, maybe five numbers you get back. Now you have a genome, which is six billion letters. So how do, how do you deal with that? Were you able to extract any clinically relevant and actionable information? Because I remember hearing back, back in the day that Steve, maybe it's from Steve himself, he said, I, I don't have the compliance gene. So whatever they told me, I didn't really pay much attention to. So it's great to analyze a full genome, but if the, if the patient doesn't really... You know, it was so funny, and it's so funny that you remember that. Yeah, I um, I was chatting to him recently about this, actually. Um, so, so yeah, w one of the first things we did was manage to rule out that he was at risk of, of any uh, sudden death uh, through these variants that I'd seen on the screen. But we did find he had particularly high cholesterol, and even this uh, little uh, particular cholesterol molecule called lipoprotein little a, which is particularly bad for, for heart disease. And so we actually fed his numbers into the standard... Um, tree algorithm at the time to see if he should get a statin, he should get cholesterol lowering medication. And it said, oh, don't know. I mean, basically the algorithm went, oh, it's up to you, somewhere in the middle. And so we looked to his genome to see if we could actually use that to, to make a, a clinical decision in his part. And the, the medical team, with all the information, which included the fact he had pharmacogenomic variants that would suggest he would respond to statins, pharmacogenomic variants that would suggest he wouldn't have the side effects of statins. And then uh, polygenic risk score suggests that he was it indeed himself personally at high risk of coronary artery disease. We went ahead and recommended it. And as you mentioned, you know, we were, I didn't know this was going to happen, but we did an interview on, on NPR uh, the two of us together, kind of doctor patient thing. And they asked him if he was taking the statin and he wasn't. <laughs> so this came out sort of on national radio for the first time, but I can tell you because he mentioned this publicly uh, last night that uh, he, he did finally give in. 
and he is now uh, taking that cholesterol medication. <laughs> oh, okay, but very good. Um, interesting that you you were you probably one of the first team to really analyze a genome's worth of data from the from the Helicos platform. I mean, so this wasn't a Lumina or four five four, and ironic, I suppose, that you were able to um, perform a a although it's very early days a meaningful clinical genome interpretation. But the platform had other issues, and so that that's sort of a, 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 a bit of a, a sort of a post-it note in the history of the sequencing, uh, next-gen sequencing. Um, but obviously, it had great potential. So it's a pity in a way. Yeah, I think there are just there are many ways, of course, to do this, and lots of really exciting new companies coming up even to this day. And in fact, Telescope, that technology had a little resurgence, and there may even be a company that brought the patents back to life yeah. uh, and is working on them. Um, yeah, it was a 20x genome, so pretty early days. Dimitri had written all the software himself to, to do the variant calling, and then we built from scratch, essentially, the software to, to go from there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think every other genome, with the exception of a few handful medical genomes, that a few that we've done in the last decade have, of course, been on the Illumina platform. Uh, but this first one, where we built these tools to begin with, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a very unique <laughs> platform. So we'll, we'll come back to this theme in the next 40 minutes but for, for the rest of the program. But it's been 10, 11, 12 years or so from then. You obviously had high hopes for this field, but I mean, can you do the experiment where you go back and tell yourself, are you, are you, ex are you surprised at how far we've come? Can you kind of encapsulate the then and, and where we are now in terms of this field? Yeah, and I actually, well, I, one of the quotes that is most meaningful to me in, in, in this, and I put it at the beginning of the last chapter of the book, it's actually from Bill Gates, and you might have heard it, where he said that most people overestimate what they can do in one year but most people underestimate what they can do in 10. And I think that that's exactly the way I would answer yeah. your question is that we were so wrapped up in the excitement of this at the time and so much, uh, well, your, your book at the time, The Thousand Dollar Genome was, yeah. you know, heading off the shelves. And I think everybody was thinking one day we might get down to the, the thousand dollar genome. And, and there was a, just a great deal of excitement about what was possible. And, and I think we realized something that I don't think I really got myself when we went into this, that people are fascinated by the genome and what it means almost about being human and some level not just it's not just health and disease but it's really who you are at a very deep level and so there's a lot of interest in in the work at the time and i think we just felt that well in a two or three years you know this everybody's going to have their genome available who, who wants it and we set off over that time thinking that but really it took a while it took a few years to, to pick up but i think if you ask me then and this is the, the point of the quote i think you know 10 years later where have we come today? We've actually come very far. And I think I, I'm actually very happy with, with where we are. Just in the last um, few weeks, we actually launched uh, at Stanford the, a genome backbone for all our cardiovascular panel testing, uh, which is to say that now we think about being able to think about the architecture of disease across the whole genome. So there's a polygenic component complex or modifying component, even from Mendelian disease, and that it's got to the point where uh, rather than capturing just a small number of genes or even a, a kind of mid, mid sized number and then focusing on a small number, you could just capture the whole thing in the background. And then if you need to reflex later, you can do that. If you want to call a polygenic risk score or update one across the whole genome, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think for where we are today, it's actually a really exciting moment, but it did take 10 years. I have a few more gray hairs than I, than I had when we first <laughs> yeah. had that idea. So we all. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Chris, but just a quick note for the audience. We want your questions. Chris and I have got plenty, but we want to put those to one side and ask your questions. So please enter your questions at any time in the Q&A box. Chris, back to you. Yeah, so uh, so really, uh, based on, on the work that you did on, on, on Steve's genome, uh, you know, a couple of years later, you and a bunch of the people on the Dream Team, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, including Michael Snyder, Russ Altman, and, um, and, and, and John West to lead the company, you launched, you helped launch Personalis. Can you talk about what the original focus of the company was? And like any startup, I know that there have been some hiccups along the way. Um, if you could talk about, you know, how the company may have pivoted and where, to be where it is today, where it really seems to be gaining the kind of traction perhaps that you had uh, envisioned at the original startup. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question. And, and any, obviously any successful company is, is obviously going to have to remain nimble and understand where they're going. And 
we originally started the company because of the work we did on Steve's genome and then the work we did with John West's family. It was uh, one of the, the kind of humorous parts in, in analyzing John West, one of the first families to be, certainly the first family to be sequenced on the Illumina platform. Uh, he came to us and we were analyzing his, his genome and, um, and then this question of potentially starting a company came up because at the time we had lots of incoming uh, requests for analyzing genomes, kind of like we did for Steve and, and John and his family. Like people were saying, well, I hear it's now affordable. It wasn't still in the range of which it was fairly um, affluent people who were contacting us, but we were getting an increasing number. And we realized that our, our academic labs were not really equipped to start to do this at scale. And this is an ent going to be an enterprise level uh, endeavor. And so we were started, we started to chat. I chatted a bit with um, Ross Altman and Atul uh, Butte had been chatting with Mike Snyder. And of course we were all chatting together. And essentially the idea came up that, that with all these requests coming in, maybe we should look to try to, to start a company. So we started chatting to a few different folks that we knew in the, in the venture world. Um, but the big question I think for any academic when they start to think about starting a company is, is who can look after the business because academics, I think, in general, are, are not well suited uh, to to the to the uh, business of business. Um, and many many times they do leave, and, and and sometimes they are technical CEOs for a while. But we really were interested to see if we could find a business person. And then, you know, one day we we realized that I tell the story a little bit in the book, but we had one essentially not just staring us in the face, but we were staring deeply into the genome of of somebody who could potentially be the business lead for this venture. And it was John West himself because he had been the CEO of Selexa. He'd been the CEO at the time that Selexa was sold uh, to Illumina and had continued to run the sequencing business there. He'd, uh, he'd been um, in the sequencing business for, for many years. Uh, but actually he had the same idea in mind that it was one of those funny things where we came to talk to him about it at exactly the same moment the thought came to him. And so, so there the company began and we began with the idea that there were people out there who wanted their entire genomes uh, sequenced and analyzed and that that was going to be a new thing. And there were other companies beginning to think that. Uh, George Church's Know Me at the time, there's a few others in, from history that were thinking about that. But then it became clear over the next few years that the focus for genomes in the short term was actually maybe even not gonna be genomes, it was gonna be exomes. And so we looked at some of the technical limitations about exomes and started to think the exomes were great and that's, you know, 2%, a lot less sequencing, a lot cheaper potentially. But one of the challenges was there were regions of, of the exome this when we were capturing the genes that were just not well covered at all. And that there were areas like first exon in particular, high GC content, uh, high AT content areas where there were really no coverage and you couldn't make a call, which might be fine in the research world because you can still make lots of discoveries with an exome. But if you move that into a clinical world, we're, we're in a world where we were using Sanger sequencing. And if one or two base pairs of one exon wasn't callable, you can't call the exon. And so there was a little bit of a mismatch. And so we set off really as the company got, got going more seriously to think about filling in the exome and augmenting the exome. And I think some of the, the, the technology that was invented at the company was, was among the earliest, among the first to, to do that. And we were certainly in that field for a little while but then I think a, a, a big pivot came because what we saw coming was a slightly challenging scenario, I think, in diagnostic testing. And it remains pretty challenging today. I think one of the, you could even talk in the context of the pandemic, but, but you know, one of, there's a huge um, contrast between the way in the US that uh, therapeutics is funded and the way diagnostics is, is funded. And uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's amazing that it's such a hard road in many ways for, for really cutting edge diagnostics that can clearly save money uh, and, and getting reimbursed even for $1,000 or $2,000 can be hard, whereas sometimes therapeutics are costing $30,000 and somehow they seem to be reimbursed. So it's definitely a contrast. And I think John and the team at the company really saw, saw that coming. And meanwhile, saw an, a really interesting opportunity in cancer. And so the company moved at that point from Mendelian disease testing using exomes and augmented exomes uh, to, to, to focus really more firmly on cancer and the emerging revolution in cancer biology fueled by genomics and in particular immuno-oncology. And so they started developing new products that really are uh, on the very cutting edge and were of really great interest to, to farm the pharmaceutical industry. And that, that meant our customers changed from being uh, doctors and uh, healthcare workers, genetic counselors who were ordering a test for Mendelian disease 
to folks in the pharmaceutical industry who were really interested in, in generating the next, the next generation of, of drugs. And so that's been a very successful change. Of course, along the way, uh, personnel is also one of the, the major sequencing uh, powerhouses. We're very proud of the team for doing that. They supply the, a lot of the sequencing for the Million Veteran Program. And so mm -hmm. population level sequencing is something else that the company has really done from, from the beginning. And the, the team, uh, many of whom came from Illumina originally, uh, who are in place there are really among among the best in the world. So it's been an incredibly exciting adventure for us to be part of it as founders uh, and to continue to be very connected to the company. Uh, but of course, the real credit uh, for the company goes to John and, and Rich Chen and, and the, the folks who, who are doing this in and out all, all day, every day. Can I just jump yeah. in there, Chris? When you and when you, and you've hardly addressed this, but this was um, when Personalis was getting launched, you, there were several other companies and we're being sponsored today by one of them. Omisha mm -hmm. became Fabric. Um, I remember Cypher Genomics and Dietrich Stefan's SV right. Bio, and of course George yeah. Gnome or Nomi, however you pronounce it. Um, why why didn't that sort of field kind of coalesce and take off? Uh, it seems like some companies either pivoted or got acquired or went out of business, um, and some one or two like Fabric have survived and evolved and seem to be flourishing. But do you have any thoughts on why is it because of the diagnostic, the reimbursement problem, or was it something else? Yeah, I think great question. Well, first of all, really nostalgic question. So uh, first of all, George Church, I don't think ever really knew how to pronounce know me or no. I, I heard him pronounce it both ways. Um, and also, yeah, this is a great point that Omisha back in the day was one of the first companies we spoke yeah. to. Yeah. Um, and I, honestly, the first time we did a trio analysis, it was with the Omisha program. I've forgotten what that software was called, but it was it was with that uh, software. And great. so great to, to see them continuing. And of course, yeah. now it's Fabric uh, Genomics. Yeah. Uh, it's great to see their focus and their success. Um, I do think it is uh, down to exactly what you said, which is the reimbursement scenario and the uncertainty around it. I, I do think it's changing and it's improving. I guess maybe it's another thing that just takes time. Um, but I think that one of the things, and just this is my own you know, editorial on this or my own, my own theory, um, is that whereas with pharmaceutical companies, they're of course, you know, they already, first of all, they already have um, you know, the, the weight of, of the size of their company and, and the, the capitalization that they have to be able to, to make sure that they can fund the trials and then do the work to get them through regulatory uh, funding and then do the work to make sure that there are people prescribing them. I think that the weight of individual diagnostic companies is not quite at that level. I mean, I think just by market capitalization, that's clear. And that perhaps if the diagnostic companies kind of got together as a, as a more cohesive group, they could have the same weight as the pharmaceutical industry in, in kind of lobbying around the world for, for good and, and proper reimbursement. The diagnostics is of course, just as important as therapeutics, they, they go together. I mean, sometimes specifically as companions, um, but they really go together. And I, it's, it's quite, it's been frustrating. And I mentioned this with the pandemic. I mean, what we haven't had the testing we would like to see in the home setting during the pandemic. And yet we have these incredible vaccines. And I think that part of that is actually this mismatch that we have within our system, at least in the US, where diagnostics, uh, the journey for diagnostic companies is quite hard. Um, but it's a little bit more of a clear path. Not that it's easy, but it's a, it's a little bit of a more clear path for therapeutics. Thanks, Chris, back to you. Yeah, I was, I was going uh, along those lines. I think um, one of the things that's occurred to me, I, when I, I used to talk to diagnostics companies uh, you know, a few years ago when there was a lot of work on companion diagnostics for therapeutics, it seems that companies that uh, have a diagnostic basis have seemed to do well to to survive if they figured out a way to serve both the patient side through the diagnostic and perhaps clinical decision support mm -hmm. while also leveraging, you mentioned the dollars that pharmaceutical companies have. So leveraging the data that you have developed in-house with your diagnostic. I used to ask people if pharmaceutical companies should subsidize the, diag the companion diagnostics, but it seems like companies in your space and the personnel space have kind of figured out a way to play both sides and, and to stay viable that way. Yeah, I do think that staying open to a variety of, of who the customer answers to the who the customer is question is, is really important. Um, and I think partnering with these companies is really what this is about. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of risk in the pharmaceutical industry because these, these trials are so expensive. 
And I think that part of what precision medicine can bring and part of then what these diagnostic companies can bring to those pharmaceutical companies is kind of a risk abatement measure. Uh, and that's part of the general uh, value proposition for precision medicine generally. You, you get the right medicine to the right patient at the right time and then your delta is much larger. And we've seen that from the early, early days of Ivocaptor and others, uh, but now many, many, many times. And the same, of course, in cancer is very clear. If you can define better the biological basis of cancer and attack that biological basis, the, the chances are your effect size will, will be much greater. Um, and so how that uh, shakes out kind of on the enterprise level it's interesting. There are some big pharma companies who obviously have invested very heavily in-house in, in that kind of technology, and they've built very large genomics platforms and teams in-house. But I think it's also true that there's a particular, you know, I think you do something better if you're entirely focused on it. And I do think that the complexity, let's say, of, of cancer biology and thinking about just the, the sheer amount of data that you can get from a genomic approach to cancer, because we're not just back in the day of thinking about the germline risk, first of all, and then the tumor biology part. Now we're looking at the immune system. So we're thinking about the invading T cells and we're thinking about uh, fusions, of course, that occur. We're thinking about HLA. Um, there's, so, there's so much that can be derived from genomic information in relation to cancer. And now we're, we're talking about liquid biopsy, which of course, very hot field. Um, and personnel is obviously uh, launching in that area as well, liquid biopsy and a personal uh, liquid biopsy product that goes along with the, the tumor sequencing because the, the real benefit of course for many patients is having an understanding of the tumor that you you have or have had and then the ability to follow it later it's a little different from what grail and some of the others have, where they're going after primary prevention in cancer i think that will really be an interesting field as well but maybe the earliest and the lowest hanging fruit in some ways is to be able to follow uh, the therapeutic response to a tumor by being having in your armory liquid biopsy too so just an incredible amount of information and I think often it's going to be a specific company, a specific group who specialize in that, that may, that may be best able to offer those kind of services. Okay. I'd like to turn to the audience for a question uh, uh, from Gerard Honig, who's uh, with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. He thanks you for this great discussion. But mm -hmm. uh, so, so Gerard asks, from any indications, there are opportunities to improve outcomes with genomics, uh, but not necessarily through companion diagnostics per se. As a result, there can be great research progress without a lot of translational re, uh, progress. So do you have any advice for a nonprofit funder as to how to address these systemic issues? You know, how to, how to drive funding models, regulatory advocacy, reimbursement and the like? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And thank, thanks for that, that question. And I, I do think that this is part of the challenge that I, and I touched on it a little bit earlier. And we're now seeing some, some leadership uh, on this from Illumina as one, one example, but I think it's gonna take a, a real grassroots effort as well. And from patient groups in particular can have a really strong voice for regulators and for our lawmakers. Uh, and I think it's gonna take all of that uh, because again, it's not, it doesn't quite have the cohesion of the pharmaceutical industry uh, it's, it's a lot more smaller individual groups. And, and then this is another example is that rare disease, and obviously I talk a lot in the book about rare disease and the genome has had its biggest impact so far uh, for rare disease. And we, we all know well in this field and rare disease day is coming up February 28th. Um, but while rare disease is individually rare, it's collectively very common. You know, one in 15 people in the world has a rare disease. And the genome is, rel is rel relevant for every single one of those people in general. They're usually, for rare disease, there's a genetic basis in, in almost every case, whether we can find it or not. And so I think that there is this situation where the group of people who could really lobby are, are more fragmented. And I think patient groups or funding groups, uh, I think could really act as um, forces of, of um, coalescence, if you like, by bringing the right people together. And, and I've, I've been part of this with some patient groups where what's happened is they've used a little bit of funding, but a lot of their voice to bring the right people into a, an actual room or these days a virtual room to talk about it and then produce a white paper that's then summarized and, and, and spread around. And I think getting the attention of the regulators, regulators and, and lawmakers in that way to push this field forward can be very powerful, especially when there's a patient voice at the front of it. So I would absolutely encourage that. I think that as well as obviously funding basic research, which is important, translational research, also important, 
but I think this part has been a little bit neglected and, and the combining force, the convening force of the patient bodies to bring those groups together to have a, a louder voice, I, I think is, is very uh, positive and something that, that should, be, should be more of. Good, great. Um, another question from the audience from uh, Carlos Verjan, who is at the National Institute of Geriatrics in Mexico City. Uh, Carlos asks, although it seems we're advancing very fast from the point of view of biomedical research, there's still a lot of reluctance on the part of clinicians to uh, use genomics, not only because of the difficult analysis, but also because uh, the amount of papers that are generated daily in the different branches of genomics. Um, how do people in this, how, how can you convince people or how can people in this field be convinced of the power of genomics uh, and to use it in their daily practice? Yeah, well, a couple, a couple of different ways of answering that. I think the first is that uh, decision tools are really what allow the harnessing of all this genetic information to be distilled down into a report that a clinician can understand and read quickly. And I think com companies who operate in this space, the genetic testing space, and, and Fabric is one of those uh, working in the panel space where they can have tools for diagnostic labs to be able to provide information in a, in a nugget form, in a, in a form that a clinician can understand very quickly. I think that's really important. And, and other diagnostics companies have, have gotten really good at summarizing. You can look in the supplement if you like, and there'll be four or five pages describing it. And, and most doctors are not going to have time for that. But the top most important information, including actionability uh, indications are near the top of the report. So I do think that's a, a good move. And I don't think that we need doctors to be able to see under the hood for all these tests. I think we, they need to know what the actual information is. But I think there is this change coming and we touched on it briefly earlier with the, the concept of, of polygenic risk scores because the world we live in, and I'll just give you an example from cardiology, if you have risk factors or even if you're just 40 years old uh, and go to your doctor, you're gonna get asked about smoking, you're gonna get asked about diet and lifestyle and cholesterol and diabetes. And those will be put by most doctors into a little equation that will give you an uh, indication of your likely risk of a heart attack over the next 10 years. If you go over 7% on that risk, you're going to be recommended like a statin or if your blood pressure's in the, in the gray zone, a blood pressure medication. The trouble is that for both of those medications, for, sorry, both of those conditions, we know there's a very significant heritability, very significant genetic component. And at the moment, it's not incorporated, not even by family history, at least not in the US and the, the Europe and the other places they do include a family history question. But what's even better than a family history question is knowledge of your genome. And so this, I think, is, is we're really reaching the moment where the polygenic risk scores can be now folded into those scores. I don't think they should stand alone not least because genetics doesn't stand alone from environment, they need to be folded in. And they are better than the individual risk factors. We know this, if we take that example, a polygenic score is more powerful than asking if someone is smoking, it's more powerful than asking or finding if they're diabetic. If you add up the traditional risk factors, they are better than the polygenic risk score together, but the whole thing together is better than any of them. So we really are at a situation now where we can take a condition like heart attacks, which we know have significant genetic and environmental components, wrap them all together and give that information to the doctors in a way that really doesn't need them to understand any genetics at all. Because what they're gonna do is still do the same thing. They're gonna ask the same questions and they're gonna get back a number that says the, the risk of a heart attack over 10 years is X percent. But this time it's gonna be a more precise and accurate estimate because it's including the genomic data. And so that's why I'm really excited about how genomics is coming to the forefront of medicine, to primary care, not just to genetic clinics where it's been sitting, not just the cardiology clinics where it's kind of been trying to knock at the door for a little while, but to primary care where most of the prevention is actually done. Yeah, I think this is a great segue to the next question. I mean, what you're talking about in putting, uh, you know, the information into, into actionable packages for doctors to be able to see, they don't need to know what's going on under the hood. Certainly none of this could be done uh, or you couldn't provide this without uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and, and AI to be able to go through all those papers that Carlos mentioned, to be able to pull the relevant bits of data out to make this analysis. Um, I understand that you have a new AI startup. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what its, what its focus is? Yeah, and so this is another really exciting technology that uh, came out of the lab just a few years ago. And uh, it combined a couple of, of areas that have been quite hot and quite exciting for a while, uh, which is microfluidics. So the ability to put and separate single cells or even single 
um, molecules, but uh, single cells is what we're dealing with here. Uh, and, and AI, which in this case is the pictures of the, of the cells. And so we all, I think, understand well the move from, from tissue-based diagnostics or tissue-based um, assessment for research into a single cell world. And we really are, the, set, the cell is the singular unit of biology. And it makes complete sense that we're starting to have tools that can really understand that biology at a single cell level. And so thinking about how we could do that and, and how it might impact research and also clinical uh, diagnostics, a uh, postdoc in my, my lab, uh, Maddie Maselli, started to work on a microfluidic system that was connected uh, to a fast camera that could then start to learn what cells look like. And then essentially what the company is able to do, and the company is called Deep Cell, uh, is basically use that information in real time to start to sort cells. So we, we sort cells at the moment with say fax analysis where we have a fluorescent marker and we can push cells left or right depending on that one molecule and how much it fluoresces. What we've only just begun to understand is, is what do cells look like uh, with, and, and how uh, much more detailed information at many multiple levels we can get about individual cells. If we then have that and can combine it with an ability to sort them and, and then we sort of ride the wave of single cell biology where we can now sort the cells do, for example, transcriptome sequencing, understand the cell at a very deep level and feed that back to the AI system. I think now we have a really interesting situation, not just for discovery genetics and, and discovery immunology, discovery cancer biology. We're really excited at the application of the technology in those fields, but actually clinical uh, diagnostics too. And when you think about the revolution of cell-free DNA and Steve Quake, we talked about earlier, was, was one of the first to, to put that forward for fetal diagnostics. Uh, well, I think what's even better than short fragments of DNA that are, that are uh, circulating in someone's blood is whole intact cells. So whether it is fetal cells or whether it's cancer cells, we're also really excited at the clinical application of, of being able to rapidly sort uh, and recognize cells from the circulation and then apply these new tools of single cell biology. So, so that's what Deep Cell does and uh, it's, it's a great uh, group. Uh, we started in a garage, which was exciting. So proper Silicon Valley garage started with personalis. We were in an office from the beginning. It was it was very nice, but there was actually right. a garage. <laughs> exactly. So proper garage startup, and now uh, with a much uh, larger team of people, and uh, they're they're just an incredible incredible group bringing together this kind of wet lab microfluidics with uh, computational a AI. It's it's very exciting. So we have another question from the audience. It's going to take us from the ones and zeros and the ATGAs to um, CTGAs to, uh, to therapeutics. And this is going to be right down uh, right down the middle for you, I think, you And, and the question is, uh, what direction is the field of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy therapeutics going right now? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's dead center of my interest. And for those of you... Uh, I imagine I, I'm a cardiologist, so you would understand that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a Mendelian disease of the heart muscle, where the heart muscle gets thick and stiff. Um, and uh, but also, I, I uh, direct the Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease at Stanford, and we have clinics there, so we see a lot of uh, patients, and have the privilege and honor of of looking after several thousand patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and working uh, in this field. It's a really exciting moment, and it's also uh, one that I kind of lead up to a bit in, in the chap couple of chapters, actually, in the book, where I focus on a particular patient story uh, for a, a very close patient of ours uh, who was affected by this condition. But a really exciting moment, I think, for therapeutics for it. We have understood since the early 90s, classic work in the Seidman lab at Harvard really elucidated the genetic basis of the disease, and, and these are variants found rare variation in the molecular motor of the heart, myosin. Uh, myosin heavy chain, myosin binding protein C, troponin, these are the proteins that are, make up the molecular motor of the heart. But, you know, we, we haven't had uh, until recently any kind of precision therapeutic. What we give people were drugs that were developed in the 60s and 70s, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers that do help a bit uh, for sure, uh, but not that much. And they certainly don't attack the underlying basis of the disease. And so what's been very exciting actually is there's a couple of companies now, uh, Myocardia and Cytokinetics, uh, both actually with technology that came out of Jim Spudich's lab. Jim is a um, molecular, uh, sorry, a, pro a protein biochemist, at Stanford, Alaska award winning uh, scientist who has looked for decades at uh, muscle biology and myosin in particular. He actually now has himself a startup focused on malaria right now, which is very exciting. But he uh, helped found these two companies 
And I'm really excited that the phase three results for the myocardia agent, this is one that's aimed at the molecular basis of the disease and kind of turning down the overall force of contraction, because that's, that's what's wrong in this condition, that the force of contraction is too high and that causes the cardiac hypertrophy uh, thickening and, and stiffness. Uh, so this is a, a small molecule that reduces the, the force of contraction by changing the time uh, of that uh, cross bridge cycle. Um, and it's, it's showing spectacular effects. So in the, in the phase three trial, the uh, were very significant findings for patients feeling better, patients being able to do more. And actually just in the last couple of weeks, some very interesting data mirroring the animal data, but nice to see it in humans from cardiac MRI studies showing some reversal of the disease which is just you know, un unprecedented. And I mean, I've, I've always believed it's possible, uh, but many people, because the hard subterminal differentiated organ felt that it might not be possible. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, Cytokinetics, another company with a, a drug coming up on a, in a similar class. So I think a very exciting moment for, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy therapeutics. Uh, so another question, uh, this one about pharmacogenomics. Uh, the question is how can we apply pharmacogenomics in chronic disease management besides using it uh, for companion diagnostics or for therapeutic monitoring? Yeah, and so, well, this, this is a great question because it actually touches on something that we've talked about many times and back to Kevin's question about what did you think was gonna happen uh, 10 years ago and what did happen? Because I think that 10 years ago, we thought the first thing that's gonna happen is pharmacogenomics. That's gonna take over because that's the thing that everybody gets immediately. The idea that your genome is, can help decide which medications you should get and just like your doctor looks up your medical record to make sure there's no interactions with drugs you're already on, uh, your doctor would look up your medical record to make sure there's no interactions with your genome. Like the, the software, if you like, literally software was already there to do that. But it didn't quite happen. And, and even 10 years later, we are not at the point where really any physicians are regularly using pharmacogenomics. And I think that... Um, you know, with, with hindsight, I, I think we can make a guess as to what will happen in the future to answer the, the question, which is that it, the biggest challenge is the 12 minute appointment and the fact that the data isn't available right now. Because if you have 12 minutes in primary care and you need to make a decision, then you need to make a decision with the data that's right in front of you right now. And if you have to send a test, a pharmacogenomic test, it's gonna take a few weeks to come back and then bring the patient back and then give them their high blood pressure medicine or their cholesterol medicine that is, is not really gonna work with the workflow that we have. What you need is for the patients broadly to have this information already available. So we wondered if it might happen through direct-to-consumer testing. There's 25 million people who have information, genetic information with 23andMe or Ancestry or others. Um, hasn't quite happened there either, um, but we are hopeful actually part of our rollout of the genome backbone that we've talked about at Stanford is to include pharmacogenomic elements in that. And so our hope is that the data from any of our patients will actually be available already so that when the doctor comes to prescribe, basically it just pops up on the screen. And that I think will lead to a step function change because the data is there, the, the evidence is, is pretty good and, and increasing. Um, and there are guidelines, CPIC guidelines now to help us understand when we should use pharmacogenomic information. I think if, as long as it's already there, I think we'll see a step function change and it'll really uh, take off. Yeah, great. We have about uh, seven minutes left, so we're, uh, I'm, we should go into maybe a little bit of rapid fire mode here. Yeah. You and, um, you know, so uh, people are sleuthing the genome all the time looking for, you know, the genetic basis of, of, of various diseases. Are there any particular groups out there that you're paying attention to that have impressed you with their work lately? Uh, in terms of pushing forward the technology? Uh, technology, or even they've made uh, a, a diagnosis of a rare disease, and the and the way they went about it was particularly interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there are amazing groups, and one of that one of my regrets, if you like, in, in the book is that I, I, you know, I tell our stories, but there are so many people working in this field, and so many people uh, doing just incredible work, and many people on whose shoulders we stand. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited, honestly, by uh, long read technology. And I do one of the chapters focuses on, on that and particularly a case uh, where we diagnosed uh, a patient uh, with carnage complex based on Pacific Biosciences technology. And so I do feel that there are, there's a very complementary uh, uh, relationship there between the short read technology and the Illumina technology that has dominated and, and continues to be our workhorse for, for all the clinical genomics and the newer long read technologies from Pacific Biosciences, Oxford Nanopore and, and other approaches as well. So I do think that for solving rare disease, I think that's a very interesting new area. Are you integrating the long reads now on a routine basis or is it only you, do you bring them in 
if if the illuminaries don't give you the answer that you're, you 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 set out for? Yeah, so we're we're envisaging a world uh, in the fairly near term where we do it uh, prospectively, but at the moment we're still doing it as a as a reef wipe. Yeah. We're bringing in the long reefs where we do it. But I, I think as every year and every few months, even the technology gets a bit better, the accuracy gets higher, the cost comes down. It, it really becomes a much more viable idea. You quoted a figure in the book of seventy four percent, and if I have the context right, that was the sort of the positive rate when you start with a, um, a, a diagnostic odyssey. Um, is, that, is that your experience at Stanford or is that sort of a community-wide, uh, where three out of four cases now where we're able to find the presumptive mutation? Yeah, so it's probably actually a little bit more like 40 to 50%. Yeah. Um, when the 75% number though that you're remembering is coming from the fact that within the undiagnosed diseases program, when we make a diagnosis, which we do about 40% of the time, then 75% of the time it's made by the genome. So if we think of all the tools in our, in our box, then 10% of the time, just to, to, to write, we, we do it through the, the Sherlock Holmes approach. We stroke our chins and bring smart people in the room, take the history and physical and make a diagnosis without any formal right. other testing. But three quarters of the time it's the genome. So solving rare disease really is all about the genome. And how do we improve that, uh, that rate? If, if it's only one in two. Um... Right. More biology, no, I, <laughs> better. Yeah, I, th I think it's really also a question about the future. I mean, I think, um, so first of all, uh, think, thinking about RNA sequencing is one, one way for sure. Some great work from Stephen Montgomery and others as part of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. Uh, so transcriptomic sequencing, I think, can help. I think long read approaches and, and other approaches like BioNano and others that can get us structural information, that can get us to large scale rearrangements of the genome, I think very interesting. And that will, I think, push us further up. I think many of these undiagnosed conditions might end up being immunological in, in basis. And so I think we need to get better at understanding the immune system and particularly the genomics of the immune system. So we can do the things like B cell repertoire sequencing, which I think is really interesting. And that might take us a little further up. I think we'll continue to nudge it up, just better information, more discovery genetics. It will start to push that up. But, but I agree right now, our hearts and minds are with the almost two thirds of people, like certainly 60% who, who are not still not diagnosed even by our most uh, cutting edge technology. Thanks very much. Chris, okay, I can let you get the last few questions in. Yeah, yeah, I have another one from the audience. It's quite long, but I'm gonna to try to boil it down here. And uh, you know, we've heard a lot about cons uh, consumers driving he healthcare in the US. And uh, so there's a lot of feeling that there needs to be education of the consumer about genomics and the role it can play in their health. You know, from where you sit, how do you think we should go about educating consumers? Certainly your book is a start, but how do we educate consumers uh, so that when they go to their doctor, they know the right questions to ask about, uh, you know, th their genome and whether they should be tested for certain diseases? Yeah, it's a great and really important question. And I think that to an extent, you know, this year, of course, we've all last year, we've, all, we've become experts in virology and immunology in ways that we didn't before that all sorts of people who've never said T cell or B cell are now asking me questions, you know, about about those. And I think we need to do a similar thing for genomics, because of, on that topic, there's some misunderstanding about the mRNA vaccines and some people thinking that it might be like gene therapy and change their genome. And so certainly some education required there. I agree. Uh, one of the purposes of, of the book uh, is to try to help bring genomics to the lay reader and to people who might not normally see that. And I've been really encouraged at just a, a handful of comments that have come in in just a couple of days since the book's been out and some of the advanced reading copies where folks have said they enjoyed reading the human stories and it led them to, to make their way through the science stuff, which they wouldn't normally read. And, and that makes me feel good as long as, as long as they could stick with it. I was happy about that. We, we need better genomic and genetic uh, education, I think, uh, with up-to-date uh, education happening uh, at school, high school, and even younger. Uh, I know biological classes, of course, do talk about DNA, but I think that the field has moved so fast that a lot of the high school curricula uh, don't really deal with what we can actually do today. And that's a very human side of, of genomics. So I'd like to see that happen as well. Yeah, very quickly, um, there are some people who uh, foresee a future where newborns are routinely sequenced, right? And that would be able to provide information for pharmacogenomic testing. How soon do you think that that might happen? Well, certainly the technology to do it is here already. Uh, and um, uh, 
um, Robert Green and, and the Baby Seek Project and others have, have worked on this. I think the interesting thing about that is when they asked how many people really wanted it, it was a little bit lower than, than some of our, the aficionados, or those of us who are really excited about the technology might have said. I think it's a very personal decision. I mean, we have the ability to sequence a baby's genome even in the womb from the cell-free DNA or even potentially cells from the circulation of the mother. So we could do it even earlier. Uh, the question is, do we want to? Uh, and obviously, uh, in order to uh, understand and prepare for potentially devastating disease, most people would say, yes, I want to do that, although some people would rather not know. Um, I think doing it, the whole genome on everyone, analyzing the whole thing, I think it, we're not probably there yet for most people, although technologically it's possible, I think ethically and certainly personally, uh, most people probably don't want that yet. Kevin? Uh, did you have another question? Or I've got one, one more thing, uh, you and we want to bring up with you. We were doing some very intensive uh, research uh, on our subject for today's show, and uh, we stumbled on this. <laughs> Could you please explain what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is this is my research lab, as yes. it turns out. I, I have a, a research lab on the, the health benefits of, of single malt scotch. Um, yeah, I do, <laughs> this is a, a corner of my house where... Uh, we do indeed have a few, uh, you're mostly Scottish as you can see there, though oh, they're not Italian. Well, there's, I mean, you know. there's some Japanese. Some and, and Japanese a, you know, maybe, down on the lower shelf. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, and maybe one <laughs> Irish somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this has been a fascination uh, of mine and I've been, you know, back pre-pandemic, we certainly enjoyed uh, yeah. many of the scientists and medic med uh, doctors that, that we know spending a little bit of time thinking. This about was election better. night, wasn't it? Yes, yes, this was, yeah. that's right. It was election night. Yeah. That was a tough, that was a, a nail-biting uh, moment, a nail-biting yeah. few days. So. Well, hopefully the royalties from the Genome Odyssey will allow you to replenish. Some of these are looking a little bit, uh, a little bit empty. So uh, uh, we wish you every, every luck uh, restocking the bar. I mean, I've seen uh, uh, many hotels with worse, uh, worse collections than that. So, uh, well, thank you so much. We we'll have to invite ourselves look, over after the pandemic. That's right. I look forward to inviting you all over personally when we can, when we can <laughs> do that and uh, how, having you uh, choose your own selection. V very good. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, I'll take a pour of the Macallan 12 if you don't want uh, <laughs> You got uh, it. You got it. Anyway, uh, that's all we have time for today. Uh, Thank you, Ewan, for joining us uh, and providing some insights into your work and uh, the landscape of, of, of genomic medicine. Um, uh, we want to thank our audience for joining us. We also hope that they'll join us over the course of the year as we have five other uh, clinical omics live episodes planned throughout the course of the year. Um, I also want to close by thanking our sponsor, Fabric Genotic, Genomics. So for the entire team at Clinical Omics, I'm Chris Anderson. We'll see you next time. And don't forget to pick up a copy of Ewan's The Genome Odyssey released just yesterday on Celadon Books. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Ewan. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.